Uh, next, this, this might be more interesting for students, our satellite projects. We started in 2006 with uh, CubeSat, so very typical process for universities or, or small groups. They, they start with the CubeSat. Uh, one U, so uh, 10 centimeters in each dimension. And the development time was, was very long. This is our first project. Uh, this is something I worked on as a student, actually. But both of these, uh, I, I was still a student at this time. And I worked on these two projects uh, for, for about six months. The first satellite was not launched. We had uh, an initial agreement with an Indian rocket, PSLV rocket, but there was a launch interface issue, and, and we weren't able to launch. At the same time, we were able to get more funding for a larger satellite, uh, for U2, 30 by 30 by 30. So in 2010, we changed gears and started to focus on this satellite. In both cases, we, we include almost all of the students in our laboratory. We have about 30, maybe 35 students in our laboratory. And each satellite team has about 25 students who are responsible for the entire process. Uh, recently, uh, I'll talk about this later, uh, in, our, in, our, in our recent satellite projects, they're a little more professional, semi-professional, so we have a lot more involvement from the staff. But these are student satellites. And we incorporate the satellite projects into the official educational program. So not only do our students do state-of-the-art research, or not only do they try to do state-of-the-art state research, but we also ask them to apply systems engineering and project management approaches to the satellite projects. So uh, a little bit more about the history. Uh, this is just a few more pictures uh, showing, showing some of our, our CAD models. And uh, this, this, this is a, a little more critical. If, if anyone here is thinking about starting a, a CubeSat project or, or, or working with us on, on a satellite mission, the development schedule is, is very crucial. Especially at the beginning, it, it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of inertia to start up. But we, had, we only had about one year for our second satellite. That worked because we had spent four years on our first satellite developing the bus systems. So I would say that it probably takes two years at least if the satellite is, is fresh, depending on the scope, if there's almost no experience. But two years should be enough uh, now. Uh, satellites, small satellites are becoming very popular. In the last few weeks, uh, almost 60 nanosatellites have been put into orbit. Uh, one, one rocket from the Wallops mm -hmm. launch facility in the United States sent 29 satellites into orbit, one main satellite and 28 small satellites, and a Denifer Russian rocket took 32 satellites up uh, one week later. So <laughs> satellites are all over the place now. That has led to, to an interesting rule, uh, the orbit rule, that says satellites in, in low Earth orbit need to return to the Earth or, or burn up in the atmosphere in at most 25 years. So there are a number of design constraints that are introduced uh, because of that. Uh, in any case, here's a, a little bit more detail about our satellite. It was a technology demonstration satellite. So we, for Hoyu-1, the small satellite, we really just wanted to show off the concept. By the time, five years later, we were working on Hoyu-2, we wanted to actually tie into our research on the ground. So the main mission was high voltage. Uh, this, this panel generated high voltage in space. And the reason that's important is because for high power spacecraft, like the ISS or, or larger spacecraft that will exist in the future, it's very crucial to have high voltage to mitigate transmission loss from one end of the satellite to the other. It's also possible to do that with very large cables, but the satellite mass goes up very drastically. And, and that, that's a big problem for satellites. So we, we want to use high voltage in space. But if we use high voltage in space, the arcing and discharge numbers go way up and, and in many cases drive satellite failures. So what we did, uh, we generated high voltage, this relatively high voltage compared to uh, voltage here on the ground. This, this is very low, but uh, high voltage for space. And we're able to successfully mitigate most of the arcing. 
uh, I'll show the experimental results in, in, in a few slides. But speaking about the, the development cycle, generally speaking, we have the following satellite models during, during the, the design period. We, we start, of course, with a conceptual design. We look at the technical feasibility and the complexity. And if it's reasonable, we start actually building. So this, this is something like the brain, the onboard computer of the satellite. And usually, people start with a breadboard model, or BBM. Then, in parallel, we work on the structure thermal model, the STM. This is like the body of the satellite. And once these two both check out, we lay out the entire satellite on a table, a flat sat or table sat. And we check all of the interfaces and do testing where we can see and check everything uh, with as much space as we need. Then, when that checks out, we build a prototype, an engineering model, that is almost exactly the same as the flight model, but this undergoes extensive testing in the same configuration as launch. Finally, we, we, we make a flight model and do less test, some testing, but less vigorous testing and, and prepare this one for launch. Uh, a few things about CoreU2, uh, this, this is mostly for our own students, but uh, for a student satellite project, we, we have to be careful not to be too ambitious. We don't want to increase the likelihood of failure beyond what the students are capable of. So we uh, use, in some cases, well-proven or commercial off-the-shelf technology. And because our budget is uh, usually student satellite projects rel have relatively low budgets, we, we usually don't use space-qualified components which means testing is even, even more crucial. Uh, this is just another slide about the development strategy. Uh, there, there are a number of different ways to keep the cost down, uh, using passive attitude control, minimum deployment, uh, and, and minimum outsourcing uh, to professionals. Just another slide on that. This, 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 this is interesting, uh, especially for, for people who are considering uh, building a satellite. This is one of the reasons that so many small satellites fail. By definition, a small satellite usually has a small budget. And we did a study on the number of person days, something like man hours, but person days it took for us to adequately test our second satellite for YouTube. And it was almost 2,300 person days. That cost for a company or an agency would be very high. In the case of a university, it's very low because we, <laughs> we have lots of students who can, who can spend time in the lab. But this is one of the main reasons that small satellites with low budget don't undergo extensive testing or even adequate testing. So we're, we're focused on, on allowing, allowing uh, companies and, and universities to, like I said before, test small satellites quickly and at low cost. We, we think we can do both for, 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 for these satellites. And, and take this number way down. Oh, this is another slide showing showing the same data. Uh, finally, in 2012, in May, we were ready to launch. We launched on an H-2A rocket. It's a Japanese rocket. We were one of the secondary payloads. There was a primary payload, and we were one of four small secondary payloads. And we were, we were successful. I'll go back to that slide. We, we took some pictures of the Earth, I was confirming that we were there. This is the picture from our satellite, so very low resolution. We had a very small, low resolution camera, only 168 by 128 pixels. And uh, this is the area that we captured when we, we, we overlaid this on an image taken by an actual professional meteorological satellite. So, so we just took a picture uh, that small. But we also were able to capture Japan, this is Honshu Island, mm -hmm. and this is Kyushu Island of Japan and the Korean Peninsula. Uh, more importantly, our primary mission was successful. We were able to generate with our, our high voltage solar array, we used a fairly novel technology, to generate over 300 volts. And previously, the highest voltage generated in space was 160 volts by the International Space Station. So we, we drastically exceeded that. And uh, this is the problem that comes up. The, the green line 
shows the generation potential. The red line shows the satellite potential with respect to the plasma potential. And it's quite, quite, quite negative. It could be positive or negative, but it's quite negative. Almost minus 200 volts. And if we, if we imagine a, a simple aluminum sphere or conducting sphere that was put in a plasma environment, this wouldn't be a problem. The whole object would charge relative to some reference, but nothing would happen. However, for a satellite that's composed of many different materials, in particular a solar array surface that has a dielectric and a semiconductor, usually covered by some sort of a cover glass that, that has a completely different dielectric constant and photo emission uh, number, dielectric charging, uh, I'm sorry, differential charging occurs. So even though the satellite body is at minus 200 volts, some other parts of the satellite might be at minus 100 volts or minus 300 volts. It's very hard to predict. There is a lot of study that goes into predicting the potential of different materials that are placed in different radiation and plasma environments. So at this voltage in low Earth orbit where the plasma density is relatively high, arcing happens very, very frequently. And then we studied that on, on this satellite a little bit. Uh, the blue line shows temperature. So uh, we're just confirming that we were able to control the temperature uh, within, within, within reason. And then we went into eclipse. And the, the generation voltage and the spacecraft potential went back to the reference. So th this, this was very good, uh, very good for us. Uh, so in conclusion, we, we, were, success we were successful. The, the critical point. That, that we noticed comparing our two projects was that we had a launch opportunity from the beginning for our second satellite. So the motivation was very high. We found that to be very critical for, for the students and, and for the staff. So, so we really think uh, if, if, if uh, n now, now it's not so bad. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, it was very difficult to get a small satellite into orbit. The first CubeSat was launched in 2003. By, by from the University of Tokyo. So it's, it's very, very, I mean, 10 years only that CubeSats have been put into orbit and now the numbers are going up drastically, which means that there's a market for low mass, low cost launchers. So, so it's not so bad now, but it's very important to, 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 to have a launch opportunity in place. So uh, where, where are we going next? Now we were scaling up a little bit. These are our two current satellite projects. Horu 3 and Horu 4. Uh, Horu, Horu is, uh, is the name of uh, a, a mythical Japanese creature. It's some sort of a cross between a uh, Chinese dragon and a uh, Japanese dragon. It's some, some strange mythical creature, creature that, that um, is kind of the university mascot. So, so that's why we, we have this name, Horu. Uh, two satellites. So in both cases, we're, we're going on the same theme. We're supporting our electrostatic discharge research. Before, uh, on the last satellite, we generated high voltage and some arcs happened, and that was good. But now, what we want to do is actually acquire data related to that arcing, very specific data. We, we, we have developed for both of these satellites an onboard oscilloscope that will capture the current waveform, the current discharge waveform when an arc occurs. At the same time, on this satellite, we will use a deployable camera. Actually, we have two cameras. Uh, there's another one on the other side. And then a third one for looking at the Earth uh, that will take pictures of the arcs for intensity and location purposes while we capture the current waveform for, for advanced study uh, when, once we send the data back to, to the ground station. So a similar theme in, in both cases. And here's a, a quick look at this satellite. This is the, the 3U. 30 centimeters by 10 by 10 satellite. We are going to deploy solar arrays in this case. And we also have some submissions doing uh, inter-satellite optical communication. This satellite will be released from the International Space Station. I'll talk about that um, in the next few slides. So we're going to try to do some laser communication with, with the ISS. And a quick look at the internal structure. Very, very simple. <laughs> These are very simple uh, CAD models. Uh, this satellite is, is the priority right now. This, this satellite is semi-professional. 
and I'm spending spending a fair amount of time on this one, as are most of the, the staff members and students in our laboratory. So besides the main mission, which is to generate high voltage with this array, we also have a number of submissions. We can talk about this in more detail if you'd like, but we are going to demonstrate a small plasma thruster, take measurements of the local plasma environment. We have two different communication bands, uh, the radio frequency band and the S band for, for large data, for our picture and experimental data. And we also have some surface potential and electron emitting experiments and one material degradation experiment as well. So there, there, there are a lot of components to this, to this mission for a small satellite. For large satellites, they're very advanced. They do many things. Uh, but for us, we, we've scaled up uh, one, one order of magnitude. Uh, so briefly, I, I mentioned the, the, the CubeSat launcher. Let's see. Let's stop here. Um, the ISS now has uh, something called the, the J, JSON, Small Satellite Orbital Deployer. Uh, there are some YouTube links. I'll, I'll make this presentation available. And in this case, the satellites are taken to the ISS on a cargo ship and put in this, this launcher and deployed by an astronaut from the space station itself. So it's a much safer way for, for satellites to reach orbit. And a lot of the uh, vibration and, and launch risks, uh, deployment risks, are mitigated. So, so far, there have been nine CubeSats that either have launched or will launch from the ISS. And in 2014 or 2015, we're not sure yet, uh, our, our HORU-3 satellite will be, will be in the next round. And we hopefully will develop another satellite uh, one or two years from now with an international partner uh, to do the same thing. These are just some pictures of satellites that, that have been released already. So uh, good examples of universities and, and agencies that have developed small satellites for uh, many different reasons, uh, but at, usually at, at low cost. Uh, so finally, how, how does this relate to, to students and, and collaboration? Starting in April of 2013, so just six or seven months ago, we, we officially established a Space Engineering International course, SEC, that's taught in English. This is the curriculum that I teach in. And to support that program, we also have a fellowship program called PNST, Postgraduate Study on Nanosatellite Technologies. The fellowship program is supported in part by the United Nations and the Basic Space Technology Initiative, BSTI. And this, 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 this fellowship program started in 2009, we started talking about it in 2009. Uh, more recently, we actually got the funding. But the, the objective from, from the BSTI standpoint is to help establish space technology and, and space programs in emerging markets and non-spacefaring countries. And when we heard about this opportunity, we were, we were very interested. So we started in 2009 uh, working with the UN. And the reason for that is because we really believe that long-term fellowships are, are necessary to close the loop on the technology transfer process, to, to really enable a new institution or an emerging country to, to have success in the satellite and space field. We want to train students for two or three years, two years for master's students, three years for PhDs, and completely integrate them into a project where they have to not only think and be innovative, but also build something from scratch uh, in, in a, in a university-like environment. We think it's, it's easier to do than a space agency or, or an industry due to all the rules and, and regulations. So uh, in 2011, we, we started this program. At that time, we only had internal funding uh, and a little bit of funding from the UN. But the UN doesn't really fund students. It's, it, it, uh, it, it helps a lot more in other areas. So we accepted two students in 2011 and two, two students in 2012. 
at that time, the, the support was, was a little bit limited. Of course, we covered tuition and fees, but the living expense, I, I should change this to, to dollars, this, this is about 800 US dollars per month. So that's pretty low for Japan. It's the bare minimum to, to get by. However, based on the initial success of the program, we were able to obtain funding from the Japanese government in the form of a MEXT fellowship. And we increased the number of students per year from two to six. And the living expense support almost doubled from about $800 per month to almost $1,500 per month. Uh, living in, in this area in Japan, that's, that's definitely sufficient, more than sufficient to, to live quite comfortably as a student. And uh, these changes just started from October of 2013, so the first class of six students just started. And as I mentioned before, the curriculum is in English, and for master's students it's two years, and for doctorate students it's three years. I, I do want to say that the students who participate in the program do not need a fellowship. You know, some students have a fellowship and they come, that's great, but we were open to students who have their own funding or funding from uh, uh, their home institution or from some other third party. So uh, we offer the fellowship program, but it is competitive. And for example, uh, in, the, in the last year, in 2013, we had 83 applicants from 28 countries for, for six spots and that number will probably go up, I think it has gone up already, for <coughs> the next class for 2014. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Um, in case of uh, a student from, from the University of Mexico is selected, does this program also fund the, the travel expenses it, from it, Mexico to it, it provides uh, round trip travel economy class <laughs> from, so, so yeah. <laughs> from, from Mexico to Japan. Okay. So yes, yes it does.